Happy Pride Month, everyone. With the recent death of George Floyd and all of the protesting for Black Lives Matter that's been going on, I thought that it was the perfect time to bring up a discussion about how whitewashed queer history is. Well, why does everything have to be about race? Shut the fuck up! And to focus on a more accurate portrayal of queer history, a more well-rounded portrayal. If there's any name that's associated with Stonewall and the gay rights movement of the 60s, no doubt it is the name Harvey Milk. The all-American drink. Ah. But there's other people who helped spark the gay rights movement. Other people who were there serving on the front lines when everything went down. I've been trying to get up here all day for your gay brothers and your gay sisters in jail that write me every motherfucking week. Why are you here today? Darling, I want my gay rights now. This week, I want to focus on Marsha P. Johnson, the outspoken gay rights activist who didn't just fight for LGBTQ rights, she also fought against police brutality. No, we were too busy throwing over cars and screaming in the middle of the street because we were so upset because they closed that place. What were you screaming in the street? Huh? What did you say to the police? We just were saying no more police brutality and uh, we had enough of uh, police harassment in the village and other places. Oh, there was a lot of little chants we used to do in those days. What made her a legend is Stonewall. I winded up being at Stonewall that night. I was having a party uptown. I was uptown, I didn't get downtown until about 2 o'clock because when I got downtown the place was already on fire and it was a raid already. The riots had already started and they said the police went in there and set the place on fire. They said the police set it on fire because they, they originally wanted the stone wall to close so they had several raids and there was this uh, Tiffany and Oh, this other drag queen that used to work there in the coat check room, and then they had all these bartenders. And the night before the Stonewall riot started, before they closed the bar, we were all there, and we all had lined up against the walls, and they were all searching us. The police were? Yeah, they searched every single body that came there, because uh, the place was supposed to be closed, and they opened anyway. Because every time the police came, what they would do, they would take the money from the coat check room and take the money from the bar. She was here throwing things. I don't know if she threw the first shot glass or a brick, because I don't think a shot glass would break that window either. We heard it, because that started everybody breaking windows. I think it's about time the gay brothers and sisters got their rights, and especially the women. <laughs> Who was Marsha P. Johnson? Oh, you should see her when she puts it all on. She got the black pants and the white shirt. She moves yes. like real. Like a real Did you see body. this morning's treatment? Didn't you love that? What was this? Born on August 24th, 1945, in Elizabeth, New Jersey, Marsha was one of seven children to father Malcolm Michael Sr. and mother Alberta Claiborne. I'm not even going to bother to sew the sleeve. I'll sew it tomorrow. No, they won't check it. Too expensive to check? That's right. Around five years old, Marsha began experimenting with dresses and more effeminate clothing, much to her father's dismay. As I was growing up, I met a lot of men. But they never appealed to me, you know, too much sexually. I used to try and keep away from them because of my hometown. If you were homosexual, you were out of it. And they would call you all kinds of names. Um, and then when I first came to New York, I was 17 years old. That's when I started getting kind of transvest, more like a transvestite. In 1963, Marsha left Elizabethtown, New Jersey, with nothing more than a single bag of clothing and $15. At age 17, she left her hometown by herself 
and moved in to Greenwich Village in New York. In order to survive, in order to feed herself, she turned to sex work on the streets. I started out with makeup in 1963, 1964, and in 1965 I was coming out more, and I was still wearing makeup, but I was still going to jail just for wearing makeup. In 1969 I started wearing female attire full time. Usually I wear a short dress every day of the week. I just don't put on much makeup anything until after dark because it draws too much attention. If I were to wear a lot of makeup in the daytime, they might think that I was a male. But if I wear little makeup, they think I'm a female and they just let me ride on by. And if I wear a lot of makeup at night, they automatically know I'm female. They really can't tell the difference about me because I'm on my way to be a sex change. I have hormone treatments in my bust is uh, about uh, a small, it's a small bust, but it's a nice handful. And they feel that nice handful and they automatically go into the illusion that I might be real. You'd be surprised how many gorgeous clothes Randy got around here. I could always talk like a woman. I could always act like a woman. I could always do things that women would do because I was raised by my mother. Like I could wash, I could iron, I could cook, I could sew. Street Transvestite Action Revolutionary started out as a very good group. It was uh, after Stonewall they started. They started at GAA. Mm -hmm. Mama Jean DeVente, who used to be the marshal for all the parades, she was the one that talked Sylvia and Rivera into leaving GAA because Sylvia Rivera, who was the president of STAR, was a member of GAA and started a group of her own. And so she started uh, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries and she asked me would I come and be the vice president of that organization. The Randy buys me things to get murdered in all these tons of furs. Go in the kitchen, we'll do a little fashion show. No, we're wearing this hat and we're wearing this scarf. Maybe I should wear blue tonight for Sasha, huh? I guess this to do. Oh, yeah, the police stole the They didn't just steal the coat. My sister said happy birthday. They didn't just steal the coat, Randy. They took the coat. They took the purse. They took the jewels. They took everything. In 1992, on July 6th, Marsha's body was found floating in the Hudson River. A person who later claimed they saw her body while it was still in the Hudson River said that she had a giant gash in the back of her head. Despite these facts, and despite the fact that there was no note, an obvious possible um, nefarious activity involved in her death, police almost immediately ruled it a suicide and refused to fully investigate it as uh, anything else. To me, it was like a shock. I said, who would kill Marsha? <sighs> it's very sad that a person so giving had to meet her death like that. Because she was very giving, and she was like, she, everybody loved her. Everybody loved her. I have no intentions of getting a job as long as this country discriminates against homosexuals. She has only homosexuals, bisexuals, and trisexuals, darling. And he has no straight people. Because yeah. it is trying out women, honey.